Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. December 2021, Episode 4, Anthony Peake's Roundtable with the Public, Part 4 of 7. He is a writer who deals with the borderline areas of human consciousness. Okay, so, yeah, so I sleep with earplugs, and the um, freight train is uh, no more than 75 yards from my backyard, so I I tend to sleep with uh, earplugs. Now, um, when I get these voices... This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Okay, so there was a... Esoteric had a... um, Oh, sorry, Esoteric had a question as well. Okay. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. This is the first of these that I've done. Uh, But I did want to follow up on the astral travel uh, and a little bit more of the synchronicity. Years ago, uh, in my 20s, I used to, and actually late teens, I used to uh, basically have out-of-body experiences um, just naturally without trying. Uh, As I got older, it became a little bit more difficult. But one thing I started doing, and this is really based on the works of Ophiel. He was a person who wrote... uh, Oh, back in the 60s and 70s, esoteric uh, type of works. And OPL suggested that in the astral, you tweak things and they tweak in quote unquote reality. So I started doing that and I started getting (laughs) those effects. I would tweak something in the astral and it would tweak in what we call reality. Could you explain explain more about that? Like what? Can you give me an example? Oh, sure. Um, I, at the time in my 20s, I was living in a, uh, a small apartment, and I had a little tiny uh, um, type of table that I had a bigger piece of wood on to use as a table. It was really ridiculous, and I always wanted a nice big table. So uh, one time in the astral, as I'm having this out-of-body experience, I'm looking at the living room, and I create a table in the living room where it should be a nice large table. And about a month later, my brother-in-law moved and he gave me his table. (laughs) And and it was, uh, it was wonderful. It was a nice chrome table with a big round uh, glass top. It wasn't exactly like I envisioned, um, but it was a table. So it it met the purpose. That is extraordinary, isn't it? The other thing I want to kind of tie in here that happened. Could I just me... pause you for one second, please? That's okay. sure, just to say your volume is great. And thank you very much for coming in. And the rest of our community welcomes you because we are growing day by day and linking with other communities on our research bit. Once your question is finished, we do actually have a question that's come in from the direct messaging part. So I'll do that later. So I'll let you continue. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, that's uh, perfectly fine. And, and thank you for that. Uh, to make it quick. Uh, We were talking about, uh, some of your uh, uh, speakers were talking about uh, not just the astral, but lucid dreams and then uh, biochemical um, due to uh, DMT. For me personally, way back when, it was more of a LSD experimentation where I would take LSD in a ritual environment and try to make contact. Now, the interesting thing is whether this is simply... Uh, applying a meaning where it doesn't fit or where it actually does fit, my synchronicity level would skyrocket after these sessions, uh, usually for about a month or so. And then it came to the point where it just, I'm plagued with synchronicity ever since. So wondering, not just with DMT, if anyone else has uh, experienced that. And thank you for your time. That is is very intriguing because, of course, the... um, the skeptics uh, analysis of synchronicities would be one of two things. They either label them as being confirmation bias or conversely anticipation bias or or whatever. The idea is that um, attention bias, I should say. So whereby if you start looking for synchronicities, you will see them purely and simply because that's the way the world works in the sense that there are so many, there's so much information out there. We can see links with things. And to an extent, I'm, I'm with that. But when you start getting synchronicities taking place that are beyond all rational comprehension, and of course, going on about synchronicity, we have to understand the literal definition 
of synchronicity as was put forward by uh, Carl Gustav Jung. And he called it the a-causal principle. And the a-causal principle is the idea that there is no direct causal relationship between the two synchronicities, other than the fact there are similarities between them. And of course, a little known fact is that, um, that Carl Gustav Jung worked very closely on synchronicities with, of all people, Wolfgang Pauli, who was um, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. And of course, scientists don't like to recognize that fact, rather like they don't like the fact that Erwin Schrodinger wrote a book called What is Life, which was extremely philosophical. Nor do they like the idea that people like Max Planck was convinced that a lot of his discoveries were actually given to him, that he found them out by sheer chance as if he was being driven towards them. But synchronicities themselves, there doesn't necessarily need seem to be a link in them. Now, I find that synchronicities seem to converge in certain ways, and they also seem to have a sense of humor. You know, there's normally, when I have synchronicity, I'm waiting for the pun. I'm waiting for the joke. I'm waiting for the two or three synchronicities. The third one actually brings the rest of them in line, and you go, good Lord, what is that? And I'll give an example of this, because this is very amusing. I was quite intrigued by the 11-11 phenomenon. Not because I necessarily believe that it's, it's, it's anything mysti mystical, because people go on about, I'm seeing 11-11 everywhere. Well, it's not at all surprising, because in any sequence of numbers, four numbers, the only four numbers that will, be, will, will have downstrikes are 11-11. So that's not surprising, because this is the way we're programmed. You know, originally, down in the Ser plains of the Serengeti, when we started, we were little Lucy and Lucy's associates um, uh, in the Rift Valley. We, we've been you might have to explain that to people who might not actually know about Lucy. OK, Lucy was one of the, 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 the oldest primate skeletons ever found. It was a very young girl and it was found, I think, in the Nguru Gorge uh, in um, Kenya, I guess it was, uh, by a guy called Leakey. And the point I'm making is that when we started, when humanity started its great journey, we existed on the plains of Central Africa which means that we were programmed to look at anything that stood up um, vertical from the horizon because it could be a predator. So we notice things that are, that are vertical, go up and down, um, and we, we notice shapes. So when you see 11.11, you immediately, you subliminally lock into it because of the way we are. So that's, that was my explanation for this. And I still think to a certain extent that is the explanation. However, I'd, I'd, I'd had seen 11.11 a few times, and it was one time when my wife turned around and said, she said, you've missed completely the ultimate 11.11 ultimate joke in your life, haven't you? And I said, have I? And she said, she said, yes, you know you've got books in various languages, and I said, yes. And she said, your first book, what is the title in Dutch? And it's unfortunate our Dutch friend is not here at the moment because the title of my first book in Dutch, get this, is 11, 11, 11. It means life after life after life in Dutch. And it's those kind of synchronicities that make a shiver go up your spine because you go, oh, my God. Is this some kind of clue? Is this the 11, 11 thing is far more subtle than that. Is 11.11 a symbol of my own cheating the ferryman hypothesis? And I thought that is intensely personal. And I'll then give one final example of just how extraordinary synchronicities can be and how rooted they can be. A few years ago, I was researching um, the writings of J.B. Priestley, who I mentioned earlier on, great writer, and I've written a book on his works. And he had a book out called Man and Time. Now, I needed to read that book, but it would be been published in 1964, and it was quite old. And this was about 1999, I think. No, I know exactly what it was. It was 2000, of course it was. Um, and I needed to get a copy of the book. So I went down to my local library, and they didn't have it. So I, they had to order it from the British Library in Boston Spa in Yorkshire. I put in a chip, I paid my money and the, the request goes off. Two weeks later or so, I get a message from the library to say the book has arrived. I didn't go up to collect it for a few days. And then one day I had the car. So I drove into Horsham Town Centre down here in West Sussex 
picked up the car. I pick up the, I, I, pick, I pick up the book, take it back home, and I didn't read it immediately. It was over the weekend. Um, I take it back home and I left it in my study. And I'm going to bed one evening. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm somebody that I can't not be reading things, even if it's the back of a serial pack. I've got to be reading something. And I just finished one of my books and I went into my study and it was sitting in the middle of the study. So I picked the book up. It has about 300 and odd pages. And I'm just flicking through the pages at random. And I open one page and it seems to just open up at this page. And there's a, a picture. And I just started reading at random. And I started reading. And Priestley is, say, Priestley is saying about the way in which light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Therefore, when you're looking at a star, you're seeing as it was centuries ago. And he particularly discusses the writings of uh, a British physicist called Coleman, who in 1957, three or four years before uh, Priestley wrote the book, had written a book called um, Relativity for the Layman. And he quotes him. So here we have a whole series of chance events that had me reading that book that night. Then J.B. Priestley himself, I pick one page of 300 pages. In the page, J.B. Priestley selects a book at random and decides to quote him. So he quotes him and he turns around, there's a little box with a quote and Coleman, I'm paraphrasing here, Coleman says, imagine that on the night of the 15th of March, 2000, there is a blowout on the star Betel Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. And I turned around to my wife and I said, what year is it? And she said, it's 2000. And I said, what day is it? And she's looking at me as she does, looking at me absolutely crazy. And she said, it's the, the 14th of March. And I said, what time of day is it? And she said, it's night time. And I turned around to her and said, you're the mathematician. What is the statistical chance with all those variables of me picking up a book that somebody's picked up at random, pick a page at random that has the exact date and the time of day I was reading it? Coleman could have picked any date in history. He picked the day I was reading it. Not only that, he picked the time of day I was reading it. That was when I realized these things are significant. You need to watch the messages because there's something profoundly interesting going on. This is fantastic because one of our biggest synchronicity individuals in here is Wandering Britches. And if she comes off mute for a minute, quite a lot of your blog and your conversations on other podcasts when you're a guest there is all about these kind of things. And this must be blowing your socks off at the moment. Um. Yeah, I, well, what I like about, sorry, <laughs> I'm in the house with other people. Um, yeah, I, well, one of the things that I've been trying to get at with um, my synchronicity, I call them experiments, because I all have times when I uh, dive in there and really set the intention to try and get more synchronicities happening and then see what comes up, because I want to use them as like examples that I can write up to convey to people um guy how how honestly strange these type of experiences can be um and then another thing that i've been trying to do is uh get better at creating synchronicities where they have a nice through line like anthony the 11 11 11 one is fantastic because it's it's an unusual uh symbol right 11 the sound of 11 uh it, it's very unique and so it's easy for people to see. Sometimes you have like these very personal symbols um, and they have incredible meaning for you personally, but then to someone outside of it, they don't really get it or don't really see it. So to me, I like these examples that are clear like that. Um, if people want to go on my blog, which is Ghost Dog is a Mystery Box, that I plug it because I, uh, I can be a little rambly when I'm talking. You're allowed to do that. <laughs> I'm allowed to let you to plug that. Also, the other thing, if you're uh -huh. comfortable with talking about it in front uh -huh. of the people, you know what happens to you with mathematics in your skin? Mathematics in my skin. Well, you said about synesthesia. Oh, oh yeah. That will um, be fascinating for Anthony as well. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a synesthete uh, as well. But I want to say I have a uh, one right up, a Danger Bridge... Um, about one of my synchronicity experiments that kind of culminated during a firestorm. And um, 
So I had these kind of uh, symbolic premonitions that seemed to be leading somewhere. And then uh, during this firestorm uh, conditions, there was a bridge uh, fire that broke out and it went all across this a half mile long bridge over cold ocean water, basically, which is the most horrifyingly scary thing you can imagine because, you know, they're always telling us, oh, you should have 50 feet of dis defensive space around your home. And it's like if this fire can go over a half mile <laughs> of basically nothing to burn, um, then we're all well, screwed, <laughs> not to put it too horribly, but it's very, very frightening. But uh, so during this time, it ended up that um, my old neighbor and her son had to evacuate because they were living in Crockett, the town on one side of this bridge. Um, my dad and his wife, my bonus mom, and their two dogs, by happenstance, accidentally ended up being caught in the traffic because they closed the bridge. They ended up being caught in the traffic and having to turn around from the south side of the bridge. At the same time, my brother, who lives three hours away, just on a whim, decided that he was going to try and visit us. But he was on the, the north side of the bridge when that fire broke out. And he, he saw it and he had to turn around and go back home. So we had this very strange event that I'd had these kind of premonitions about because it's having to do with sugar. And um, it's the site of the uh, CNH sugar factory is right there, which is very famous. Um, and so like three people that are very close to me, three groups of people who are all very close to me were all like right there when this fire broke out, which is a very strange circumstance. <laughs> Because one of them lived there, which is unusual, but then uh, two of them, I mean, my dad and his wife live half an hour and 45 minutes away in the best of traffic, and my brother uh, living three hours away. Um, so stuff like that, I think is interesting, because people can see, yeah, this is an unusual circumstance, they can understand why it would have meaning to me, and uh, be emotionally charged as well. Um, and yeah, as far as being a synesthete, uh I didn't twig to it for a long time. I have a type of synesthesia where you tend to feel sounds as shapes of particular uh, textures and particular places in the body, and they can move through. So it's kind of one of those things where a lot of synesthesia it can be hard to uh, tumble to it, I think, when you're growing up sometimes, because like when they have the idea that, oh, the sound smacked her in the face, right? That's it's a metaphor, except for me, it would be like actual like, physical sensation. So you figure, well, I guess they just, I mean, and it could be a synesthete of the same type who came up with that metaphor, right? Well, or expression. Well, synesthesia is, is, is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, Daniel Tramet and his book, uh, Born on a Blue Day. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and in one of my books, I have a whole section on synesthesia. So I'm very interested to hear this. Um, synesthesia intrigues me because it seems to be the brain scrambling uh, inputs from one sensual, sensual area to another. Uh, I'm reminded of people like uh, the, Russian, the Russian composer Scriabin, who just saw the music. He saw it. And I've heard there's one friend of mine who's a synesthetic mathematician, and he literally just takes the numbers, and each number has a different subtle color. And he mixes the colors together when he's doing the calculations and the colors come out with a new mixed color. And that new color is the answer to the mathematical question. And you're thinking extraordinary. This proves how extraordinary the human mind really is. And I am really interested. And there will be somebody I'm hoping that she might join in. Maybe it's a little problematical for her because she's based in, in, in Australia. Uh, but there's a, a young lady that I've interviewed in the past and will be continuing to interview in the future, um, who's one of only, I think, about five people in the world who has superior autobiographical memory in that she remembers every single, single event of her life. And she appeared on my own podcast a few weeks ago and we tested her live. While it was going out live, we tested her because we knew that she was a great fan of Harry Potter and we knew that she'd read all the Harry Potter books. So without letting her know, my, my assistant, Sarah, who does the interviews with me, has, because she has a young daughter, she has the Harry Potter books. And I had Sarah pick a page at random on any of the Harry Potter books and to just start reading uh, the sentence and she started reading it and literally with 
within two words, our guest did the whole paragraph. I've never seen anything like it in my life. That's that, astounding when you think there's over seven books, which are over, what is it, 500 pages plus, aren't they? Yeah, astounding, just extraordinary. And that shows the power of the human brain, I think, in many ways. But, but thank you for that wandering, whatever it is, trousers or whatever it was. <laughs> Bridges, was, you're very close. Bridges, you got there. Bridges. I can only see wandering, you see. I don't see the rest of it. I know. We have that difficulty when icons move around very quickly on the screen and it's probably best that when someone introduces themselves they do the full actual title oddly enough you talking about our dutch friend renegade has actually got back into the house which is very nice so if other I, question so if i I'm said if i you, said yeah. to him if i said renegade 11 never 11 11 11 what would that mean to you in dutch Sorry, can you repeat again? If I said to you in Dutch, 11, now 11, now 11, what would that mean in Dutch? I don't know. Life, Actually, we don't. life after life after life? Oh, we like Leven. Yeah, Leven. Leven. My, pronu Leven. my Dutch pronunciation yeah, yeah. isn't good. Yes, 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 yes. So Leven, yeah. now Leven, now Leven. Which yes, is life after life after life. Let, let it be, um, just let it be life. Wonderful. You, you, it, when you check up, we, we were discussing the, uh, the, the title of the Dutch edition of my first book and a, a coincidence with 1111, but I just thought that would be good. OK, so what was the next question then? Anybody out there? Uh, was, who's next then? The next question that was coming in from Oni, and hopefully I'll phrase this correctly. He was asking. Did you say something, Melissa? <laughs> I had my hand up. That's okay. Go ahead. Oh, I always ignore you. <laughs> One day I'll get it right. Never ignore your co-host. That's, That's what I'm we say. <laughs> At least the wheels more. on the bus haven't come off Sorry. yet. One small That's interruption. Uh, I'll be gone when my uh, coffee is finished. So uh, when I'm uh, leaving, no offense taken. Uh, Oh, it's so nice that you could actually just pop back in again, because, I mean, you are one of the community, which is great. And there's a lot of our community that have come for at least seven different sessions, and they've stayed for at least over two and a half hours each time out of four-hour blocks of information. So I just can't, I can't express how much it means to me and Melissa when you keep on coming back and sharing information. So don't worry about dipping in and dipping out. Yeah, I just think it's a bit, it's a bit odd to... Uh leave without saying anything so uh, that's why i say no okay uh melissa once i finish this one i'll let you have a go if you want okay so only asks me to ask you anthony if you're in a light sleep and then when you're about to wake up you hear someone calling you but then when you actually wake up there is no one there so probably asking to put it into context that you know of what's happening in the brain. Yeah, that's um, not an unusual experience. It seems that either we're picking up on sounds, because of course here it is interesting, isn't it? In that you are hearing the sound of somebody calling your name, but you're not hearing it with your ears. So in other words, it's not as if your the drums, the drum in your ear is vibrating. It's an inner sound that's created from somewhere else that your senses process. And indeed, tell them that... about the picture falling down on the bedhead. Oh, right. Yes, this is this is one of my favorite stories. Um, in my first book, I discuss the way in which time seems to dilate when we are in hypnagogic state or when we're in dreaming states. You know, effectively, you, your alarm goes off, you go back to sleep, you have a whole dream and the alarm goes off again and you've been away for hours okay so this is intriguing and i'll guarantee that the vast majority of you have experienced that and that time dilation effect is cru a crucial element of my cheating the ferryman hypothesis which again we might discuss later but going to the, the this particular example um around about 100 110 115 years ago um, there was um, a famous French... Hang on one second, Anthony. Your audio is going a bit peculiar. Have you changed anything? No. No, it sounds fine. Okay, it's still actually to go away when I was looking at the audio recording and also my headphones. Hopefully my headphones are okay. Sorry, please continue. 
Okay, so going back to the work of a guy called Alfred Maury. Now, Maury was a French psychiatrist and neurologist. But the reason he'd become interested in neurology was a very strange event that took place when he was a child. And it's of significance for my overall hypothesis that he was, he was ill um, with a very high fever. And that's very important. I think fevers have a direct relationship to altered states of consciousness. But he was having a high fever. And in the high fever, he has this vivid dream. And in the dream, he is he's one of the group involved in the French Revolution, 1789, 1790. And he's he's there working with the main characters of the French Revolution, Marat, Robespierre, uh, all the other characters. And he works with them and they they decide to kill the king. And they kill the king and everything else. And he he then becomes a major member of this group. But given time in the dream, he falls out with with Robespierre and Marat. And there's a big show trial. And in the show trial, he stands up in the court and he defends himself. He makes these long speeches to defend himself and everything else. And the people cheer and everything else. But he's still condemned to death. So he's condemned to death and he's taken out of the, the room and he's drawn through the streets of Paris in a tumbrel, which is kind of the, the things they used to drag them through the streets. And the, cheer, the people are cheering or they're booing him and everything else. And he goes through the streets and he gets to the um, Place de la Bastille where the guillotine is set up. He stands in front of the guillotine and he makes this long speech to the crowd. Then he puts his head down on the guillotine, on the, the, the bottom of the guillotine. And as he does so, the guillotine is released and he feels the guillotine smack him on the back of his neck. The headboard of his bed had fallen and hit him on the back of the head. Now think about this for a second, as he did. That whole dream was back created in time to accommodate the event at the end. That is scientifically impossible. You can't go backwards in time to create something unless when we're in sleep states, time has a totally different meaning. So in other words, the, her, the brain, his brain seemed to think I've been hit on the back of the head. How could that possibly be? Oh, it could be a guillotine. How could I be underneath the guillotine? Well, I must have been involved in the French Revolution. What must have happened in the French Revolution? Well, I must have been somebody that fell foul of a trial. And the whole dream was created. And he was so intrigued by this that he became uh, a, a, a brain scientist. That is absolutely extraordinary, for me anyway. I think you'll find that all of us will agree that is amazing. And I will actually let my co-host have a conversation with you. And then we go to Gabe. <laughs> um, thanks, Paul. Um, I just wanted to ask, Anthony, you're talking about when you're about to sleep or as you're waking up, sometimes you might hear your name being called, um, but it's your eardrum's not vibrating, it's inside your head. What about sometimes when you hear your name being called, but you can hear it like a distinct voice outside of your ear? Because I've experienced that a few times as well. Yeah, so have I sometimes. And it seems to be quite strange because it's outside of yourself. It's not inside your head. It's outside there in the external environment. Um, and there are, there are many noises that experience. And again, um, many, some of you, well, if you're all new to my work, you won't have heard of this. But for many years, um, well, no, I'll, I'll roll back. Um, around about 15 years ago, um, my wife was away on business and I was on my own in the bedroom. Um, and I wake up at around about three o'clock in the morning. And I'm woken up by a sound, a sound that I recognized that I'd heard many times in the middle of the night all through my life, but had never really registered the fact. It was almost like, you know, I was talking about hypnagogic imagery. I think there's hypnagogic sounds that you don't really register. You, they just become, you came so used to them that they become part of your background. Like I have tinnitus and the sound of tinnitus is continually there which apparently I've been told is a low key um, uh, seizure that you have continually. Um, but that's you should also put in there about audio deja vu. 
That's also fascinating, which will link with the hearing. Yeah, deja senti. It's, yeah. it's interesting, too, that you say that you, you were woken up at three, because normally if I'm, if I'm fast asleep and I get woken up, it's always at three. Well, that's intriguing. And then I've looked, yeah, and I've looked it up and, it, you know, there's a lot of things that say it's, it's the witching hour yeah. back in the day when witches were around. Um, and I think it had something to do with the time of day and where the sun was at, at 3 a.m. in the morning. I know of multiple women at this present time in the last several months are having all between three and four. And again, I think Anthony will agree with me that you also find that if you're on the dark side of the planet, the magnetic influence of the sun is lower. So more things actually happen within the brain for some reason. Because mm, that's interesting. So... The three o'clock thing was significant for me because the sound I heard and it was and I thought, is that Morse code? So I get out of the bed and I stick my head out the window and it's not outside. And I go downstairs and I go downstairs to the kitchen and it's still in my head. And I realize it's, it's in my head. I'm hearing it, but it's in my head. And it continued for about 25 minutes and it just stopped. And I thought, how peculiar. So I got up the next day and then that's when I realized that I've been hearing it for years. So I, I subliminally wake up in the middle of the night and it wakes me up or it sort of wakes me up, but I don't become conscious and I'm therefore not aware of it. But the next night it happens again at the same time and stopped at the same time. So I started looking up the, um, the whole, this sound and I came across, I did a web search, and I came across a website by a lady called Sharon Barrett, who is a, a USA-based artist, who's been hearing these sounds for years. And she has a website where she tracks around the world where people are hearing this Morse code sound. Now, I then, being me, I started to research this because I wasn't just happy with it being something I heard. So I started researching it, and I discovered that what I might have actually been hearing is something called HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, which is a, um, a high altitude. They're bouncing waves off the stratosphere. And they've, they've been- Can I just interject? We've got some information which has come in, which mm -hmm. is great, which will fit with the 3 a.m. section. Go on. It's been passed on by, I'm sorry if I butcher your name, it's Krista De Mayo. And she was saying that the 3M in traditional Chinese medicine is associated with the liver. Each organ has an amazing associated two hour window. Hmm. Interesting. It could be the liver diluting the alcohol. <laughs> but quite interesting. Um, so what I did was I then discovered that this heart which was something originally which started during the 1980s, I think, with uh, Ronald Reagan and his Star Wars initiative. But the original base was based somewhere in Alaska. Well, I checked up the sound of it, and it was the sound I was hearing. It was something very similar. So I thought, but how can I be possibly hearing something like this in the middle of the night on the Wirral in the northwest of England? I then did some research, and I discovered there is actually a harp place in, um, in Norway. So I continued and I thought, still not close enough. And then I discovered there's one near Barmouth in North Wales, which was no more than probably 50 miles from where I was at that time. So clearly it seemed I was hearing this harp. Now, again, if anybody's interested on this, I used to do a regular once a month, once a fortnight um, radio program on BBC, on the, British, on the BBC, uh, on BBC Radio Merseyside. And one of the most famous ones I did was about this particular effect because I had a film crew at that time following me around for a documentary. And they filmed me discussing this on the radio station. And it caused quite a sensation. People were really intrigued about this. So it seems again that sound is just as associated in many ways with both internal and external. Because when you think about it, sound is literally the vibration of the air around you. And yet you hear it internally. Again, very, very intriguing. So, so th thank you very much for bringing that up as a topic. I can add something. Uh, hi, Anthony. Hang on um, one second, please. I have some we, excuse me. 
when it, this room actually sorry. works in a principle of putting the hands up first to have questions posed, if you would like to take the opportunity to let Gabe first go with his question, and then we will come back to yourself. If you'd just like to put the hand symbol up, raised, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to On raise the, the hand symbol. icons at the bottom of the screen, you'll see four together. The second one in from the right is a heart symbol. And if you press the heart symbol, you will find another set of icons that come up. And the very last yeah, one yeah, yeah, is a hand. Thank I you very it. much. Yeah, I Gabe? Got All right, I got it. So shall I go ahead? No. Gabe is next in the queue for actually asking a question. And again, it's very nice of you to come in here and be part of the community where you just basically have a brief introduction of yourself, then with a question, a brief question, or just an introduction to Anthony, and we'll take it from there. Gabe, far away. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to add about the um, the section that Anthony was talking about, uh, the voice outside and the, vo the voices inside. So um, I, I sleep at night with, um, with earplugs because we have the... Uh, uh, what do you call the freight train? Is no more than a. Oh, I'm hearing somebody. Bax has his speaker on. Can I just do a press? Uh, good old public service announcement. Apart from the person who's actually speaking, if we can all keep on mute, that will make everything easier and run smoothly, which is great. So, Gabe, continue. Okay. So yeah. So I sleep with earplugs, and the um, freight train is. Uh, no more than 75 yards from my backyard. So I, I tend to sleep with uh, earplugs. Now, um, when I get these voices during sleep or a sound or something to wake me up, um, dis distinctly heard one night a bell. And I do have a wind chime outside, but when I have the earplugs in, I can't hear anything at all in the room. So it's like definitely there, there are voice, uh, sounds and voices that come through. Um, the voice outside... Um, nobody really likes to talk about those because they don't want to be uh, <laughs> described as uh, schizophrenic or anything like that. But um, yes, at, there are certain times when I could be sitting uh, quietly in a room and all of a sudden something tunes in like a radio broadcast out of thin air and I'll hear a voice or something. And um, it, it, it's quite a strange uh, phenomenon. And um, the, the, the last thing I wanted to add was the, uh, the dreams when they backfill information to fit the actual what's what's happening in reality um that does happen I, and i've experienced it where um I, I, uh, there was someone using um pepsi cans to uh no actually i was i was pouring water on someone's foot in the dream and i didn't have a, a glass in my hand but then the dream sort of rewound itself and I found where I was able to get that glass of water so that I could pour onto the person's foot. So my, in my experience, the dreams do run backwards and forwards at time. They're not limited to time. They, they, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a, a cue cards are shuffling in your mind. And that, I just wanted to add that part. Very, very interesting, very intriguing. In terms of the, um, the hearing voices, um, some of you may be aware of the writings of a guy called Julian James, who was a Princeton based psychologist, I think he was. And in 1970, he wrote a book called um, The Bicameral Mind, The Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And in the book, it's quite intriguing because he discusses how throughout history, people have heard voices. And the reason he was stimulated to write the book was that while once when he was doing his research, he was in his room in Boston and he suddenly heard this voice and it said something like, the, I mean, I have a quite a weird memory, by the way, and I, I tend to remember these things. I have almost an eidetic, eidetic memory. And I, I think the words were something along the lines of be the hearer, not the heard or be the listener, not the listened. And he hears this voice say this, and there's nobody else in the room. And he started to research this and discovered that it, it was incredibly common. And he came to the conclusion, and his thesis is quite fascinating. And he argues that, and we were talking earlier on about the corpus callosum linking the two sides of the brain. 
this was his argument that up until around about 3000 BC, this is the time of Homer and the Iliad, that we had no concept of self in the same way because the Corpus Colossum had 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 had, had um, hadn't fully developed. So we had a bicameral mind. We had, like we were discussing earlier, a personality in the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And that a man at that time heard his own inner dialogue as words. You know, sometimes we have conversations in our head about what we're planning to do or what we're thinking about. They actually heard the words and they interpreted them as the words of the gods. And he said, if you read the Iliad or you read the writings of that time, there's no inner dialogue going on with the characters. The characters just are motivated by the voices they hear in their heads. And he said, and of course, in modern times, this then became schizophrenia and, and how important this is in terms of the development of human society. Now, coming on from that, um, there is an organization, an international organization called the Hearing Voices Network. And they are literally, it's what is on the tin. This is what they do. They, they make people realize that hearing voices is not so strange as it sounds and is, is phenomenally common. The question is, what, who are the voices? Are the voices just again our inner dialogue, as Julian James would say? Or was there, is there more to this? And you sometimes wonder whether you, we're, we're commun we are picking up information from the information field that's around us in such a way that we're picking up other communications, we're picking up other people talking to each other. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along. <laughs>